Welcome everyone to another talk that's part of our Understanding Two conference at the University of Bucharest in uh, November 2021. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Chris Kelp. Um, Chris, the way I've um, uh, said something uh, uh, about uh, David and Daniel and uh, Stephen and Duncan, I'm going to say something about you as well. Uh, you need to know that when I was writing uh, my uh, dissertation, uh, your text uh, on understanding phenomena was a bit of an eye opener. Uh, just the very degrees of um, uh, understanding and how our respective abilities to manipulate models, to uh, interact with them, to causally model the phenomena that are their targets. Uh, just opened my eyes to the possibility that there just might be a bridge between the kinds of states that we take to be high grade and epistemically desirable and the act and the actual scientific practice. And, and yeah, that is just so thanks. Um, <laughs> that, that's a long story, but thank you so much. And um, without further ado, um, Professor Kelp's talk is titled Moral Understanding. Chris, please take it away. All right, well, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to this. Thanks for organizing a fantastic event. And to all of you who are still here, thanks for you know, staying up uh, uh, and, and, and staying on uh, through what has been a long day of really very exciting talks. Um, so I'm gonna talk about moral understanding. I gotta confess, I haven't been thinking about understanding all that much in, in recent times, but it was a good uh, idea to revisit some material that um, I've been working on in the past and uh, that like, you know, I never uh, published in, in any official way. So maybe I'll pick that up uh, with the help of your feedback here. Okay. Okay, so here's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna introduce the topic a little and then I'm gonna talk about my account of, of understanding in general and then how it applies to moral understanding. Uh, and then I'm gonna try and convince you that this is a good account. Uh, and in particular, that it it compares nicely with, um, uh, uh, favorably with a couple of alternatives that, like you know, have been discussed. I think um, particularly in relation to to uh, morality. So uh, other accounts of moral understanding, one by Paulina and the other by Alison Hills. Okay, so uh, moral understanding. Why might we care about that? Um, well, one. Um, uh, central task in moral philosophy, I take it, is to offer uh, an account of what good moral action uh, might involve, or what, what that might be. And there has been a, a view that has been growing in popularity, uh, according to which good moral uh, action requires moral understanding why. Uh, um, and of course, like, you know, in the, insofar as, as uh, we want to understand what um, good moral action is and that requires uh, under moral understanding why then we got to understand uh, also what um, uh, moral understanding why is right so so and that's going to be quite a central central task actually uh, in in moral philosophy right? to the extent that understanding what good moral action is is a central task so is this okay now Understanding, I guess, to many of us uh, is, is mostly familiar from, from the epistemology and philosophy of science literature. And very roughly, uh, um, you can distinguish between two broad camps. Uh, this is not exhaustive, but a lot of uh, accounts in the literature fall into one of these camps, right? Um, um, so one is, is explanationism or like maybe more broadly knowledge-based accounts. Uh, according to which understanding is knowledge, and according to explanations, in particular, it's knowledge of under of explanations. Uh, and manipulationists, in contrast, they don't think that there's a, so important a relation to knowledge. What matters to understanding is our uh, ability to manipulate um, representations. And one thing that's kind of interesting is that this kind of distinction uh, also kind of can be found in the literature on moral understanding with uh, Paulina um, propounding an explanationist view. Um, and we'll get to that, what it looks like in more detail uh, uh, in due course and Alison Hill's a manipulationist view. Okay, and again, what I'm gonna try and say is, look, uh, I, we've got this account uh, of understanding in general. It can be nicely applied to the moral 
uh, uh, domain, and then we get an account that, like you know, compares favorably with with these accounts in the literature. So why not go for that? Okay. So uh, more specifically, I'll introduce this account, apply it to the moral case, and then uh, look at how it it improves on Sliva and and Hills. Okay. So uh, the systematic. Uh, knowledge account, right? Um, so, so very much the the intuition that was um, was guiding me when I came up with this was like you know so so you know understanding comes in degrees. So, um, so what 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 is uh, what does it take to understand something as well as you can? Well, if you know everything, there's to know about it, right? That's the kind of intuitive um, idea behind my my view. So, if you know everything, there's to know about something, then you understand it as well as it it can be understood. And that needs a little bit of refinement, right? Um, and so uh, the idea then more precisely is that maximal understanding of a phenomenon is maximally systematic knowledge of it. So maximal understanding, the highest degree of understanding of you know, the rise of the Roman empire, right? Uh, or evolutionary theory or some such phenomenon is maximally systematic knowledge um, of that phenomenon. Okay, and what, what does it mean to say uh, that knowledge of a phenomenon is maximally systematic? Well, there are sort of two components to it. One is that it's got to be maximally comprehensive, so you got to know everything there is to know about it. And the other is that your knowledge has to be maximally well connected. Uh, and that means that um, uh, the basing relations that obtain uh, between your beliefs, the beliefs that qualify uh, uh, not as knowledge, they reflect what you know about the explanatory and support relations that obtain between the relevant truths of that phenomenon. So uh, if you know that like, you know, um, um, Stalin uh, is responsible for the death of millions, right? Um, um, and, and you know that he is uh, evil in virtue of that, right? So now you know uh, 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 the, that an explanatory rela relation or dependence relation obtains between uh, Stalin's being evil and Stalin's being uh, responsible for the death of, of millions, um, then it had better be the case then to, for your knowledge about you know, Stalin's moral status to be uh, maximally well-connected, uh, you get a belief that he's evil in part based on um, the fact that he's responsible for the death of millions, right? So, so that kind of psychological connection has to be made by, okay. Okay, so that gives us sort of the, 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 the highest degree of understanding. And then the thought is, well, what, what, what more we need to, to understand understanding is um, how we can think of degrees of understanding. So not, not everybody has the highest degree of, of understanding of much at all. In fact, very few people have the highest degree of understanding of anything pretty much. Um, um, but so, so in principle, my proposal is to understand degrees uh, of, of understanding in terms of distances to the, to the maximum point. So the closer you get to uh, maximally systematic knowledge of a phenomenon, the higher degree of understanding. And then like, you know, uh, so that gives us degrees. And then there's a question of when we sort of say somebody understands a phenomenon, right? Uh, Andre understands SSI, <laughs> right? Maybe you want to say that. Um, um, uh, then, <clears throat> then, you know, at the same time, we want to be able to say that um, um, even when that person doesn't have the highest degree of understanding, right? So we need a, a threshold that is so, somehow, at least possibly below the highest degree of, of, that, uh, uh, of the maximal threshold or the maximal point. And my uh, proposal is that you got to come close enough uh, to the highest point where close enough uh, is, um, you know, uh, uh, such that like, you know, enough about the phenomenon that you'd be sufficiently likely to perform uh, a, a contextually determined task, right? So I think very often this task will be an explanatory task for in the case of understanding, right? So we care about who can explain what um, um, to a certain, you know, uh, uh, contextual re relevant standard of explanation, um, but it might not be, right? I mean, if, if we're talking about primary school kids, maybe like, you know, who can successfully answer a, a multiple choice question about evolutionary theory that might already be enough for us to say, oh yeah, uh, little, little Jane understands um, 
evolutionary theory, but uh, uh, little Peter doesn't, right? Um, um, so it, it, it doesn't have to be uh, related to explanations, although I think they, in, in, in fact, it, it often is uh, in many contexts. Okay, so that gives us an account of um, understanding phenomena like the rise of the Roman Empire, evolutionary theory, right? Now, uh, the moral understanding debate uh, focuses on understanding why um, for kind of good reasons, right? Because the thought is that good action requires understanding why. So, um, so it makes sense to focus on that. Um, and, and so then the question is what I can possibly say about uh, understanding why, like so far I've only given you an account of understanding phenomena, right? And um, it's sort of widely acknowledged in the literature that there is sort of two sorts of understanding. This is understanding phenomena that I've just talked about and then understanding why it's at least like, you know, could be different um, or at least the relation isn't, isn't entirely straightforward, right? And, um, and so there's a, sort of some very early work made my first paper on understanding from back in 2014. Um, that I've kind of picked up on for this and, and developed a little further. Um, so there the thought is that understanding why really is a species of understanding uh, uh, phenomenon, right? So, so basically what understanding why is, is, under, is systematic knowledge about YP. So YP is now the phenomenon. <laughs> and um, basically uh, understanding YP is systematic knowledge about YP. Okay, so we analyze um, uh, understanding why in terms of understanding phenomena. Okay, and then the accounts of degrees and the maximum point and so on are pretty straightforward, right? Maximal understanding YP is maximally systematic knowledge about YP, uh, degrees in, measured in terms of distances, and then the outright understanding, we get the contextualist semantics with a contextually determined threshold. Okay, so you might think, well, that's kind of controversial to say that you can analyze um, uh, understanding why in terms of understanding phenomena, right? I mean, Khalifa in his uh, recent book, he sort of proposes kind of the opposite, right? So he wants to say, well, the really important phenomenon that we should care about is understanding why and, and everything else we can kind of understand uh, in terms of understanding why. So he says nothing of philosophical importance is lost if, all instances of objectual understanding, so what I call understanding phenomena, um, are treated as instances of explanatory understanding. Uh, so yeah, I disagree, I think. Uh, so, so he wants to reverse the direction of explanation, but I think that doesn't really work. And the reason for this is that not all phenomena um, have explanatory structure, right? So, so there isn't always sort of this kind of why uh, 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 to be understood. Right, so so the light, the layout of my house, right, at the the, the 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 kitchen is next to the hallway and next to the master bedroom, right, and 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 close to the stairs or something like that, right. Uh, I understand the layout of my house, right, by maybe knowing uh, uh, facts about where stuff is, um, but there is no kind of explanatory uh, uh, question here, right? Or there is one, but that's a different phenomenon, right? If we ask why the kitchen is. Uh, uh, there, that's not relevant to me understanding the layout of my house, right? That's a kind of question of architectural um, uh, decision making. Maybe they're good facts or bad facts, but the layout of my house does not, like you know, turn on the question as to why the kitchen is where it is. Um, to just understand that, right? Maybe the meaning of Drake, right? In order to know to to understand the meaning of Drake, I presume we got to know that it's uh, a male duck. Right? Uh, why does Drake mean male duck? I mean, that does not seem to affect my understanding of, of the meaning of, of Drake, right? Uh, that turns on, I don't know, some etymological <laughs> facts, why, why it has that meaning that like, you know, lay completely beyond me. Uh, also maybe of special interest for present purposes, uh, fundamental moral principles might also be a, a, a case in point, right? It might be that um, uh, the categorical imperative, right? I can understand it. Um, um, but maybe like, you know, maybe Kant was wrong and there isn't an explanation of why it's true, right? Why, why the categorical imperative falls is just a kind of fundamental fact um, about, about um, you know, morality that it is true. Um, um, so like, you know, at least in principle, we want, we want to allow for that. And then we, we, I want to say that we can understand the categorical imperative 
like, you know, quite well. And maybe even there's a question as to what it takes to understand it maximally well. But in order to do so, if I'm right about, you know, or if it's, if it's correct that there's a further explanation of why it holds, that's morally relevant maybe, then um, um, there isn't that, that, that isn't kind of something that we can ultimately understand in terms of understanding why. Right. This is, these, these phenomena don't have that kind of a structure. So that's why I, I think that, so basically we, we can, the phenomena that we can understand without understanding why, um, but I wanna say, so, so that gives us some reason to think that you can't um, analyze uh, uh, understanding phenomena in terms of understanding why, but it doesn't go the other way around. Um, so that's kind of some reason for thinking that if any of the two is, is prior, it's gonna be understanding phenomena. Okay. So on to moral understanding at last. Uh, so what I wanna say about moral understanding is that moral understanding is understanding with moral content. So understanding of moral phenomena, understanding of moral explanations and, and this kind of stuff, right? So, so it behaves moral understand, moral and moral understanding behaves like mathematical and mathematical knowledge and not like perceptual in perceptual knowledge, right? So it's not like that there's a, spe a specific way of coming of, of, of understanding that is moral understanding, right? Like there's a specific way of uh, uh, knowing that's perceptual knowledge. Right? Uh, I mean, I think I'm happy to say that moral understanding can be uh, um, increased and maybe obtained by testimony, right? To some extent at any rate. Um, um, and that's also true of mathematical knowledge, but not of perceptual knowledge. You can't get perceptual knowledge by testimony. You can get testimonial knowledge by testimony. Um, um, so it's about moral content, and, and that means that basically, we, if that's right, right, then we want our uh, account of moral understanding to be just an instance of the more general account of understanding, right? Because it's just a question of content, right? So whatever you have to say about moral understanding, you want it to generalize to, to other things as well, to other types of contents, right? It would be weird if uh, we needed a special um, Kind of moral understanding just because it has kind of funny contents uh, or, or different contents. Okay, and of course, if that's right, so my the the, the story that I'm going to tell is is pretty straightforward. You know it very well by now, right? Maximal moral understanding of a moral phenomenon, right? Is is maximum systematic knowledge of it where the phenomenon is a moral one, right? And the sort of the, the evilness of torture or something like that, that might be a, a, a target of moral understanding. Degrees and uh, outright uh, attributions of outright moral understanding are then straightforward. Okay, um, and then finally, the thing that's really of interest is maximum moral understanding why, right? Which again is, is pretty straightforward, right? Maximum moral understanding of YP is maximally systematic knowledge uh, about uh, YP, where P is a moral truth, right? So um, moral understanding of why Stalin is evil, right? Um, is, is maximum systematic knowledge about uh, um, why Stalin is, Stalin is evil and, and it's moral because that Stalin is evil is a, a moral truth. Okay, and the degrees and, and, and outright attributions, you have heard it enough now, I'm not gonna, uh, bother you with this anymore. So how does this view compare with uh, Paulina and, and Allison's views? Uh, so here is, is Paulina. Uh, an agent understands YP if and only if she has a sufficient amount of knowledge YP. You might ask yourself, well, what does it take to have a sufficient amount of knowledge YP? Um, and she sort of offers a couple of further uh, illuminating characterizations. One is understanding YP uh, depends both on whether they know YP and on how much they know about YP, right? Or it, she says it depends not just on whether they know YP, but also on how much they know YP. So there are two dimensions to moral understanding. One is, do you know YP? And the other is, how much do you know about y, YP, right? And you can see um, um, the, there are some similarities between my view and, and Paulina's. And in fact, this kind of earliest paper was maybe the, the, the closest that I was um, um, to Paulina's view. Uh, here I had this kind of view where you understand YP just in case you know enough to ensure that you would provide a well-founded explanation of YP. Okay, so the, the difference is that um, I don't have a requirement of uh, that you must know YP in here, 
um, and I have a kind of more specific story about how the contextual uh, threshold is is um, fixed, right? Where you know what what counts as a well-founded explanation might vary. And the reason for this difference is the the the, the dropping of the knowledge why requirement at the time was that I wanted to make sense of uh, understanding why in kind of environmental fake barn uh, cases um, and um, uh, and if you drop the knowledge and, and allow people who don't like knowledge-based accounts uh, that there isn't any knowledge why in those cases. Okay, but that's an aside, doesn't need to concern us. What does concern us, uh, need to concern us is just how similar um, um, this view is, right? And we might wonder, well, how does it differ at all? Um, well, there are two important or two notable differences. One is, I think, pretty straightforwardly fixable. The other is uh, the real issue. Okay, so um, so uh, Paulina tells us understanding why uh, it turns on having a sufficient amount of knowledge. Why? And then the question is, of course, what makes for a, a sufficient account? And Paulina agrees. Uh, uh, with me that it's context dependent, right? But you know that in itself is not really enough, right? Um, if you want this account to have like you know genuine substance, you gotta tell us at least some sort of story about how context fixes the threshold for a, a sufficient amount of knowledge, right? So that's what we find in the literature on uh, contextual semantics for knowledge, right? I mean, uh, if you think of Lewis, you have all these rules, right, that tell us how context fixes the threshold and DeRose as the rule of sensitivity and so on. These are all kind of quite specific views on uh, how context fixes um, um, the threshold for, for contextually determined threshold that you need for knowledge, right? And that's what gives these views um, um, substance. Now, this is a problem that can be quite easily fixed, right? Paulina can just like, you know, help herself to some of the views that are on offer, maybe even something that, that I propose, maybe she can find something that's better, um, that's fine. It's not a big problem, it's just a kind of an open question, I guess. The real problem, and this is like, you know, basically something that people have, have pressed me on when I first presented this view uh, and that made me like, you know, develop it further in the way that it, it did, um, people were saying, but what about Achilles and the tortoise, right? So the, the story about Achilles and the tortoise is that like, you know, so, so Achilles tried to con tries to convince the, the tortoise some proposition P by means of an argument and, and the, the, the tortoise somewhat annoyingly um, um, would always accept the premises uh, and deny the conclusion, even though the argument is, is blatantly valid, right? Uh, um, and, and then Achilles would sort of like, you know, add to the set of premises, another premise that would say, but if the premises, these premises are true, then so is the conclusion. Um, um, and and the, the tortoise then would again accept that, but not like, you know, accept the, the conclusion. Okay, um, um, so in, in, the, in, a, in a kind of moral case, right? Um, you might have an argument like this for any X, if X is responsible for the deaths of millions of people, then X is evil because of that. So uh, uh, instance of that, if Stalin is responsible for the deaths of millions, then he's evil because of that. Uh, so Stalin is responsible for the deaths of millions. Hence, Stalin is evil because he's responsible for the death of, of millions, right? And the thought would be uh, that uh, the tortoise would um, um, sort of grant, accept all the premises, but not accept the conclusion, right? And so why is that, that, that a problem? Well, um, um, that comes out when you uh, um, kind of think a little further about these cases, right? So you, you compare the tortoise with Achilles, right? So Achilles, we can say he knows the premises of the argument and he believes the conclusion based on it, right? So, so the thought is he's got a pretty good understanding of, of why Stalin is evil, right? Uh, or at least like, you know, substantive enough. Um, um, now, the case, and we can consider a case which is kind of maybe closest to the case, uh, the original version of the case, right? Where the, the uh, tortoise knows the premise, all the premises indeed, but refuses to believe the conclusion, right? And, and the observation there is, well, Ach Achilles um, understands uh, uh, the conclusion, like understands in this case, why Stalin is evil better 
than the tortoise. Now, that's not a problem for knowledge-based accounts, right? Because knowledge-based accounts um, can say, well, Achilles just knows more, right? He also knows the conclusion. Uh, the tortoise may be in a position to know it, but doesn't because they don't believe it, right? Okay, but then um, you can modify the case, right? In a way that sort of collapses that difference, right? And, and one easy way to get there is to, um, to consider a case where, first a case where the, 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 the tortoise all so believes all the premise or knows all the premises and also believes the conclusion, but based on a coin toss. So it still doesn't know it, but now believes it, right? Um, now Achilles is still doing better understanding wise than the tortoise. Um, um, and the knowledge based account can still explain that uh, because the Achilles still knows something that the, the tortoise doesn't, right? But now the, the last case is the one that is the real problem. Um, it's where the, the um, tortoise knows all the premises and also knows the conclusion, but not based on the premises, right? So maybe everything's from testimony, right? And thought is um, the, the, the objection that has been pressed against me is that, well, in that case, um, um, Achilles uh, still understands why Stalin is evil better than the tortoise, but the knowledge based account can't make sense of that anymore because the knowledge is exactly the same, right? Um, and, and that's indeed a, a problem that, that Sleva's account faces in virtue of being very close to the account that I once uh, uh, liked. Um, and, and an account that, uh, a problem that um, my account can, can improve on because it has this uh, uh, condition about these, uh, um, um, your knowledge having to be well connected, right? Where the, the basing relations that between, uh, that obtain between your beliefs have to be the, of the right kind, right? In this particular case, uh, um, you know, you, your understanding will be better if you believe uh, the conclusion based on the premises, right? So that's why Achilles comes out as uh, having a higher degree of understanding than the tortoise. And so we can um, um, avoid this kind of problem. Okay, so then the manipulationist uh, account, uh, that's quite a, a mouthful, right? So here's Hills, um, uh, if you understand why P, and Q is YP, then you believe that P and that Q is YP and in the right sort of circumstances, you can successfully follow some explanation of YP given by someone else, explain YP in your own words, uh, draw the conclusion that P or that probably P from the information that Q, draw the conclusion that P prime or that probably P prime from the information that Q, where P prime, or Q prime, where P prime and Q prime are similar but not identical to P and Q, given the information uh, that P give the right explanation Q, given the information that P prime give the right explanation Q prime. Okay, so that's the official account, uh, very detailed. Um, okay, so, so she also offers some further uh, sort of illumination on this. So she, she says these uh, a set of abilities are uh, one to six, they're kind of measure cognitive control, right? If you understand why P, then you have to have cognitive control over P. And so you can manipulate the relationship between these two propositions, right? You can see why manipulationism uh, is, is, is where this view falls now. Okay, and she also tells us something about minimal moral understanding. So she says, you can have minimal moral understanding if you correctly believe that Q is YP and you can follow an explanation of YP. And then you have, uh, greater understanding, the more uh, you fulfill these additional conditions and you have to fulfill them to the greatest extent to have full understanding, right? And she also says about degrees, right? Cognitive control comes in degrees. You can be better or worse at following explanations, drawing conclusions, giving your own explanation of similar cases and so on. If you have cognitive control to some extent, you may have some understanding of YP, but to understand completely YP, you need complete cognitive control, right? So the thought is, you know, you get um, um, minimal understanding from having a, a, a belief or maybe a true belief that um, uh, Q, Q is YP, right? That, that um, P is true because Q. Um, and to have minimal understanding, you also gotta be able to follow an explanation of YP, but that's it. That's all you need for minimal. And then it's a question of how well you satisfy these uh, conditions of cognitive control. Okay, so now here's the case. Um, um, but still on the Stalin case, right? Suppose you believe that Stalin was evil 
because he's responsible for the death of millions and suppose in virtue of this, he can't understanding why Stalin is evil. So you can also follow that, that, that um, explanation by somebody else. Okay, now suppose you wanna understand uh, better why Stalin is evil, right? So you wanna have better understanding than you have. So what, 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 what do you do? Right? I, I mean, according to me, one good strategy is to get some more information about why Stalin is evil. Well, you read a book about his genocides, right? Uh, but it's not really clear that that, that is an, uh, 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 something that, that Hills can have, right? I mean, it, it looks to her as though what we need to do to understand better why Stalin is, is evil, uh, or you were in this particular case, is what you got to do is hone your rhetorical and, and inferential skills and maybe learn more about other people who are responsible for the death of millions, like Hitler and Pol Pot, right? I mean, so then I can... Like, you know, if I, if I hone my rhetorical and inferential skills, right, I might be better at explaining stuff in my own words. Uh, I might be better at in, in drawing the relevant inferences. And if I learn more uh, uh, about other people, right, um, then I can draw these inferences about similar, like, you know, similar propositions, right? I also, like, you know, for uh, in the case of Hitler, that he was evil because responsible for the death of Hitler, right? Um, but that seems like, you know, a, 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 a kind of weird prediction. So like, you know, it's hard to see how I can, can improve my understanding by picking up a book and learning a bunch of, like, you know, more detailed facts um, about, about Stalin. Um, and, and the reason is that, that like, you know, the, all the informational stuff that is relevant to uh, Hills's account of understanding is in this belief that uh, P and that Q is why P, right? Um, that's all the informational stuff, like, you know, and, and, and nothing else according to Hill seems to be in the game for like, you know, uh, informational stuff that, that you can, seems to be relevant to a degree of understanding. Then it's all about cognitive control and that's unpacked in terms of uh, abilities and, and so on, and, and maybe information about other things. Um, so that's a little weird. Uh, on my account, in contrast, you can, reading a book uh, about Stalin is great because you will get more knowledge about Stalin and that gets you closer to uh, maximally systematic knowledge uh, about why he's evil and so it improves your understanding, right? So that's um, uh, a way in which um, my account Im improves on Hills's. Okay, now here's another case. Um, um, so suppose A correctly believes that Q is YP and can follow an explanation of YP, but only by C, who is the very best teacher on the issue. Moreover, suppose A doesn't even possess any of the abilities required for satisfying the other conditions, right? Because A maybe simply doesn't have the intellectual sophistication needed for this. Uh, and A has never actually followed an explanation of, of YP. That's, case, that's the one case. So here is a case of minimal understanding. We're, we're satisfying the conditions of minimal understanding according to Hills. Okay, so case, uh, the, the, the other case is one featuring B. B is just like A, he correctly or she correctly believes that Q is YP and can follow an explanation of YP, but only by C who is the very best teacher on the issue. Uh, suppose B does not even possess any of the abilities required for satisfying the other conditions of cognitive control. Um, again, maybe they don't have the intellectual sophistication needed for this. But unlike A, B has recently followed an explanation of YP from C and now believes that Q is YP based on this explanation, right? So according to Hills, um, they both have the belief and they both can follow the, the explanation, right? And so they have the same degree of understanding, the minimal one. Um, um, the fact that like, you know, uh, 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 B has followed this explanation, uh, an explanation recently and now believes that Q is YP based on this explanation is kind of irrelevant. Um, so to me, my intuition here is that B has a greater degree of understanding YP than A. Um, but again, that's something that's difficult for Hills to accommodate. Um, but not for me, because uh, uh, basically B acquires more knowledge, right? more comprehensive and more well-connected knowledge of YP. B now knows what the explanation says and believes YP uh, based on this explanation. So both the comprehensiveness and the um, uh, well-connectedness dimensions are improved on, so we get higher degree of understanding. Okay, last, um, 
last case uh, featuring omniscient agents. Uh, a is an omniscient agent. Agent. She is also an extremely good teacher and an extremely good logician. If you have any, any question about uh, uh, anything whatsoever, she'll always give you the best possible answer. Moreover, she never draws an invalid inference. This is not surprising. A is surrounded by inferior epistemic agents who regularly seek her counsel. And so she had plenty of time to acquire and practice these abilities. Um, B is also an omniscient agent. She's not too good of a teacher, nor too good of a logician, although she of course knows what the best explanations are and what follows from what. She has difficulties putting her knowledge into action. As a result, she's prone to giving muddled explanations and to drawing mistaken inferences. Um, this is not surprising. Uh, be surrounded only by omniscient agents and, and never had a single uh, explanation to draw or, or inference um, to draw, but explanation to give or inference to draw, right? And, and again, Hills, what she says about this uh, uh, situation is that uh, A has a greater degree of understanding why P than, than B. And I want to say, well, they are both omniscient. We can stipulate that the basing relations are also fine. Um, um, the same, uh, so they have the same, and you can see that my account again um, does better because they both have the maximal, maximal systematic knowledge. So they both have the same degree of understanding, which I th think is the right result here. Okay, yeah, that's all. Uh, basically in sum, right? I've uh, given you, presented the, the, maxim, uh, the, the systematic knowledge account of understanding, which I like. Um, how it can be applied to understanding why and then to moral understanding. And then I've looked at some accounts of understanding that like, you know, have kind of been proposed in the, in the literature, in the moral epistemology literature, and um, provided some reason for thinking that, that my account compares fav favorably with those. That's all, thanks very much. All right, thank you so much. And please join me in thanking Professor Christopher Kelp Chris, this was absolutely amazing. And uh, this is um, the time where I kindly invite everyone in attendance to uh, ask questions. And if you'd like to raise your virtual hand or signal that in chat, please uh, uh, do so. David, please go ahead. Thanks, thanks for this stimulating talk. Um, so um, I guess my uh, the, the first thing that pops to mind is that it seems to me that um, your your proposed account and the ones that you contrast it with all have seems to me the same uh, uh, potential problem, which you might call the and you will see where I'm going with that the the brilliant uh, psychopath. Um, so you know in a moral case, it seems to me that um, certain you have to be able to have certain experiences to really understand certain moral facts. So in the Stalin case, say, um, if if you you can imagine someone who can can tell all the, the relevant facts, they've uh, you know they have encyclopedic knowledge, and moreover that knowledge is systematic as you describe, you know it's connected. You know, the reason why so many people died is because you know some were left starving, and others were you know it's just all connected logically, and but they don't feel anything as they you know cognize these facts like yeah yes you know millions died you know in such and such ways yes but there's no feeling it, it seems to me that to understand you know why this is wrong you have to like feel that it's wrong and this is actually quite quite key like it's um um there, there's a, a kind at least maybe it's terminological i mean you know there's a kind of understanding that's missing if you don't have the appropriate uh, experiential response um you know there's a, there's a kind of understanding that's missing at least and i'm curious to know what you think about that yeah thanks uh this is really interesting stuff um so i i you know i don't think experience is all that um uh, important at least not in general right i mean to me it looks as though uh, you know if we have some you know om omniscient zombies <laughs> who uh i mean maybe they can't be omniscient right but they can be you know maybe uh, omniscient on, on or know everything there's to know about a range of phenomena, right? I mean, I don't think that they um, um, that their understanding is impaired in virtue of not having you know phenomenal consciousness or experiences or something like that, right? Now there might be certain phenomena, um, um, phenomena about 
like you know that 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 that, that part of the structure is like you know what it's like or or, or or has sort of having certain experiences part of the structure of the phenomenon and then knowing about those experiences right um, um, might be uh, uh, relevant right to understanding um, maybe even things like knowing what it's like to have them right and and of course that you can only have when you have the experiences I suppose um, so so it could be that um, that there are that that moral um, uh, phenomena are like that 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 it's part of the structure that it's important to like, like what it's like you know to be in, in a certain situation or something like that um, um, is important is an important part of the structure of that phenomenon then having knowledge of what it's like is going to be relevant to maximal understanding and if you don't have it like you, you don't not going to understand uh, the phenomenon as well as it, it can be understood, right? Um, um, on the other hand, you know, I would say that there are um, uh, certain phenomena to which, like you know, that that that, that you can under of which like what it's like and experiential stuff is not really part of the structure, and those you can understand perfectly without having any um, any experiences at all. Um, so I guess that's a point where we're going to be disagreeing quite uh, vehemently uh, on. Uh, but yeah, so so that's how I would um, would kind of try and deal with this question, right? So there might be related phenomena to which having experiences is relevant because in order to know everything there's to know about them, you got to have certain experiences, right? There may be maybe even some moral phenomena are like that. Maybe all of them are, right? Then I can have that. Uh, but maybe none of them are, and, and the moral phenomena, you can, like, you know, zombies can also know them. Um, um, and then we don't need experience uh, uh, in order to. Can I follow briefly? Can I yes, follow? Yes, please go yeah. ahead. Yeah. It doesn't uh, need to be so, brief. Yeah. Go ahead. So that's actually quite interesting. I like this. This is actually kind of, um, I, I'm, I think I can actually take that on board that you, I think you're saying that the reason why maybe experience becomes relevant if uh, it's required to know certain facts that are part of the, the relevant sort of phenomenon. Uh, and, and in the moral case, a lot of the time, it seems that part of the relevant facts are facts about experience, right? Suffering, that's a, that's a kind of experience. Um, so so um, I'm, I'm willing to kind of go along with that. Suppose that there is a, you know, the only the only times when experience is required is because there's uh, what is uh, what is to be known involves experiences, and you can only know experiences if you uh, by having them. Um, uh, so that's so I'm 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 okay with that condition on when uh, when experiences are relevant, but I think this that points to something missing in in your account because I don't see why on your view you need to be able to have experiences in order to know about them. So, you know, uh, there is a, a contingent limitation, like we don't know what it's like to be a bat. Uh, this is, but if, if somebody told us, you know, uh, bats, uh, bats experiences are, are um, low key experiences and they, they happen to know, right? So don't, don't ask me how they know, God told them, right? Uh, and then you can just repeat that and you know it. There, there you go. You have that phenomenal knowledge, but you can't have the bad experiences. Uh, so it seems to me that the, the person who has sort of no, no way of experiencing, say, the suffering of others is kind of in that position. They, they know the words, right? And, they say they, and then they will say, well, that, you know, these, these people really suffered, but they just know they have no ability to connect these words with a certain kind of experience that will give them the right kind of knowledge of facts. So what I'm saying is that there are two different kinds of knowledge of phenomenal facts, of facts about experience, the kind that comes from, that is tied to having the experience yourself and the, the kind that's kind of just purely verbal. But the thing is that the verbal thing can play the functional role of systematic knowledge. It, it can be connected you know, in your head with other facts and so on. So, so I think someone could, could um, lack phenomenal knowledge of the kind of robust kind, but satisfy your account. But that wouldn't be enough for, for 
moral understanding of the relative facts because it seems intuitively you need the robust kind of phenomenal knowledge. I don't know if you um, if that was clear. Yeah, no, that was clear enough. I mean, I, you know, I mean, for what it's worth, you know, I'm 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 not sure at all that uh, I would agree that you need to have all these experiences. Um, um, but like, you know, I, I think I can, I can uh, accommodate it. I mean, you, you know, you might also, I mean, basically if, um, you know, you got to know that you know in a certain way, right? Um, um, certain facts, right? So if, if knowledge of certain facts in a certain way is part of the structure of the phenomenon that we're trying to understand, right? Then you, in order to understand it maximally, you got to know that you know in that way, but you know you can only know in that way if you have the relevant experience, right? Um, um, so, so then you can, you know, make sense of of, of that as well. Um, the question is basically what the structure of the phenomenon is um, um, that we're trying to to understand. Um, I mean, like you know, I'm I'm not sure that that the phenomena are structured in that way. Um, by the same token, I'm not really sure that I agree that we we really need these experiences um, um, to understand it even as well as they could be. But maybe they are, and then we do need these experiences. Um, anyway, that that's the best I can offer. So really quickly, uh, and I'm not gonna ask a separate question, but I think I have a quick follow-up that's sort of a middle ground between what David's saying and what you're saying. Um, so um, if we think of moral conscience, right, it would seem as though oftentimes it involves a kind of sentimental education that typically uh, causally presupposes without requiring it in a normative sense, but causally presupposes having um, relevant kinds of conscious experiences, right? Something just seems reprehensible, some other stuff seems morally commendable, admirable, and so on. Uh, and on the other hand, there's the declarative knowledge of principles, if you will. And of course, uh, someone who's uh, uh, um, uh, well, on some kind of rigorous interpretation of Kant, right? Somebody who's a, 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 a stickler to principles is going to say that strictly speaking, these uh, experiences are dispensable, right? And some, some other people are going to be, um, who are going to think that experiences are the source of uh, moral knowledge are going to say, well, you, look, you just can't have the latter without having the former, right? But there seems, uh, my, my point here is that um, uh, we all seem to find ourselves uh, uh, to varying degrees, obviously um, often failing maximal understanding of, um, of the moral shape of phenomena. We seem to uh, find ourselves sort of approaching them differently from, from the standpoint of our own individual consciences, as it were. Um, without being able to factor out what in each individual moral conscience is declarative knowledge and what is purely phenomenal or anything like that. So, um, and, and the experiences in question could well be falsitical or hallucinatory or dreamy or whatever. So they don't necessarily need to be phenomenal knowledge, right? Um, and, and if so, uh, it would seem as though uh, if we have a hard time factoring those things out in uh, the, our moral perception of the situation, then it would seem that um, devising a, a, a notion of, of optimal understanding in, in terms of that distinction wouldn't um, in some sense sort of fully anchor into or reflective reality, right? I mean, I, I don't know, this is, just, this, is, uh, this is all very tentative. And so I just wonder if, I just wonder what you think. Yeah, I mean, so this is kind of very interesting stuff about like, you know, what, how 
much sense we got to make of uh, like you know how things look from the inside. I I don't think very much at all, right? Um, I mean, basically, you know, I want to say that what matters for like you know how your uh, understanding improves is like you know facts about the world, right? Um, and now there's a question like you know the way that I present the account is always quite austere, right? Only knowledge matters. But you don't you don't really have to have that view, right? You can have a view whereby, like you know, I mean, maybe a, a, a justified belief can get you closer to knowledge than like no belief, right? Um, so then this sort of stuff uh, can can matter as well, right? So if you're kind of interested in in what's happening from the inside, so to speak, like you know, then you can to some extent, use these resources to assess what's going on. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, what calls the shots, according to me, is like, you know, not, you know, how we think of things from where we stand reflectively, um, but like, you know, how things are uh, objectively. Um, so I will run out of battery very, very soon. So uh, I, I need to um, either go and get a, uh, a charger. Let me just see. Oh, yeah, I might be able to switch devices. Let me try and do that. Oh, okay. Uh, David, if you have something that fits in 15 seconds. We can't hear you. Okay, I'll use my 15 seconds to unmute. Um, so, um, I, 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 I had a, a basic question about the framework with the, the background theory where, you know, the, um, the level of understanding you have is the distance to maximum understanding. But what if maximum understanding you know, involves an infinite number of facts? Uh, I mean, they, there, it seems to me that any, I, I guess there is a way of kind of making those sort of countable, uh, finite that you, uh, you had in mind, but you didn't specify. But you know, for any phenomenon, there are an, an, an uncountable, at least, number of facts about that phenomenon. They can just formulate a bunch about you know using numbers. And, numbers. and then, but then you know the distance is always going to be infinite. Uh, Chris, I'm afraid we can't hear you yet. Okay, uh, I was I was saying that I was switching devices as you were asking a question. So um, so if I if I got it correct, it's a question um, like you know how can we uh, measure progress towards um, maximal understanding if maximal understanding requires an infinite um, like a knowledge of an infinite set of propositions and we we only have a, a finite. Uh, uh, we only know finite set of propositions. Uh, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, uh, uh, to me, it seems as though, like, you know, 100 is closer to, you know, the whatever set, the, 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 an infinite set uh, the, the, in cardinality or whatever, the cardinality of an infinite set than, than 99. Um, um, but, 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 but why that is, I got to say, I really, I don't know. Um, um, one thing that sometimes worries people is like, you know, I mean, I think that we can never get um, uh, maximal understanding pretty much of anything um, because there's just too many facts to know very often. Um, but that doesn't bother me that much. Um, uh, so I don't know whether that was a concern as well. I didn't, I, I may not have followed your question as, as well as, as I should have. Sorry for the device switch. No, not at all. Thanks so much, Chris. And uh, thanks so much to David for his question. If um, uh, we have, uh, I, uh, David, would you like to say something that's like literally a couple of words in reply or should we move on? Let's move on. 
Oh, okay, okay. But this the, this exchange between you guys is just amazing. Okay, great. Uh, next up, we have a, a question from uh, Florence. Uh, Florence uh, Choi is, um, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Florence is a PhD student in uh, KU Leuven. So uh, Florence, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Actually, I was a student of um, Professor Kat <laughs> when I was a doctoral student. Yeah, uh, thank you for the amazing talk. Um, well, actually, um, I, I find it, uh, actually my uh, project is also about human suffering. And that's why I'm quite interested to follow up the questions that um, uh, uh, Professor uh, Bruggett has asked you, because I think um, experience for human beings um, can be a sufficient candidate to justify how we know a moral inquiry to be correct or not. Let me try to formulate something like that. Maybe uh, what we have heard from um, Professor Swiwa's, uh, Christine's um, examples, I think she was angry about the incidents that she has met. And um, this kind of experience involves emotions, feelings, and um, they are all sufficiently to be justified as a kind of knowledge of knowing why that we, we understand that event is evil, like the case in the Stalin. So um, I would prefer to say experience is a good candidate to justify how we say whether uh, an event is morally correct or not. I mean, um, um, experience is a good candidate to justify uh, understanding of phenomena. I don't know. Um, how, how, how will you uh, give uh, feedback to, to my uh, claim or, or, or judgment on this, please? Uh, yeah, so that, um, you know, is, is quite possible, I guess, on, on my view. Um, I mean, it, certainly experience can give you a bunch of knowledge. Uh, it can also give you a bunch of justified beliefs, right? Um, um, it's, so, so in that way, it, it can be a good means um, towards... Uh, understanding, um, like, you know, just in virtue of having an experience, I'm not sure that's enough for um, for understanding, right? I mean, um, without any, any beliefs about what you're experiencing, right, and so on. Um, but it, I, my view can certainly allow that it's uh, a good means towards knowledge, right? And when the, the environment is correct, it might give you knowledge or, or uh, friendly enough, it might give you knowledge in a straightforward way, right? Maybe even moral knowledge. Um, so that might help with, uh, with enhancing understanding, moral understanding. Um, if the environment is, is not that friendly, it might still give you justification and you might come to know other things, right? You might come to like, you know, come to know that you have excellent reason for thinking that something bad's happening, right? And that might be something um, that you now know. You know that you have reason for thinking something or that there's justification for believing this or that. And that might also something you, because it's something you know, it might help uh, you get better understanding. Um, so I think that it's okay. I mean, under, uh, experience uh, can be, uh, that, you know, very important towards uh, generating understanding. Um, the only thing I think that I, I, I can't have is that, um, like, you know, you, you understand simply in virtue of, of having an experience, something like that. Um, um, I mean, I think, and, and this goes back to, to, um, to David's question, it just occurred to me another thing that one, one could in principle is compatible with the account is that, you know, to, to get maximal knowledge, um, you know, maybe there might be not only differences in, 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 in what you know and how well connected your knowledge is, but also in how you know. So maybe like, you know, knowing things in, 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 in different ways might contribute to uh, how, 
how uh, advanced you are in the direction of maximum knowledge. If that's right, right, then um, um, knowing in experiential ways uh, might make that contribution as well. And then they can, um, uh, I, I mean, you know, at least maximal understanding can turn on that as well. So experience can be uh, a very important, very good means to, um, to a knowledge and understanding on my view. Uh, and um, like, you know, in the moral case as, as well as in, in, in other cases. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, I get your Thanks point. so thank much, you. Uh, Florence, for the question and Chris for answering. I wonder, we're already uh, far behind, but Sogin has been very kind and generous and, and given us uh, a, bit of we, uh, a bit of leeway. Um, so very quickly, Chris, I, I suppose my question was quite undergrad and, and flat-footed and very sort of beginner style, right? Very, very freshman sounding. So, so, so it's, it concerned the way that you set up the dialectic um, and there was the explanationist account, right? And this was uh, Paulina and there was the manipulationist account and this was Alison Hill, right? And so it, I was wondering about the exact contrast between those views because it would seem as though for the contrast to really get a bite, you would first have to have some kind of um, moral understanding of why something is the case that's in some sense uh, inferentially inert, right? And on the other hand, you would have this kind of um, perhaps moral description of a situation that uh, utterly fails to be explanatory, even though it, it gets high marks on all these other dimensions. Um, and I was, you, you went through a wealth of cases and, and you might have uh, well covered this and I might have missed it, but I was wondering whether that contrast is really speaks to the bulk of uh, uh, the cases of our moral understanding, because it would seem that if I really understand why something is, is evil or why something is unbecoming or why something is, should, should make me feel shame or guilt or whatever, uh, then it would seem I should be able to use that knowledge inferentially, right? So it would seem that uh, the explanationist and the manipulationist account in, in the bulk of cases really sort of converge. And I just wanted to, to see what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the issue here, I mean, so the, the way that I set things up usually is um, not so much in terms of, here's the case in which there's uh, understanding without explanations, and here's the case in which there's understanding without, um, you know, the ability to manipulate representations. I mean, I think you can, you can give some of those cases, right? I mean, Lipton gives some cases of, of understanding without explanation, or you might think at any rate. Um, and, and then, you know, you can, I mean, like, you know, for us, these things come together, right? And it seems to me as though there could be uh, um, omniscient agents that are quite unlike us that like, you know, just have the, all the knowledge and it's all hooked up in the right way. And they understand things as well as as they can be understood, but like, you know, because that's the case, they don't really have any inferential abilities. They just don't infer stuff, right? They, they, they don't do anything at all, maybe, right? They, I mean, there's just no point. Like they're, they're these kind of passive people. I mean, that seems possible for me, right? Um, um, so, so if you wanna have those cases, I think you can, you can give them. But the, the main point, um, I think that, that I, I that, that, that's for me most crucial is about degrees of understanding, right? Uh, basically, whatever you say about like, you know, knowledge of explanations and knowledge of, um, of uh, or, or the ability to manipulate, right? That will have consequences for what your account predicts about degrees of understanding. And basically I think that um, the kind of account that I like does best when it comes to making the right predictions on, on degrees of understanding, right? Um, um, the manipulationists tend to predict things like, you know, if you wanna have better understanding, like, you know, go to a logic course, like, you know, become better at drawing inferences and so on. Like, don't, don't read books about this stuff, right? 
Um, and, and with the, um, the knowledge, the uh, sort of traditional knowledge based accounts, knowledge, understanding why is knowledge, why, right? Then you have all these cases where, you know, maybe you understand why without knowing why. And, and, and so the, that might just be too much, right? The, the threshold might be too high there. Maybe you can understand why in virtue of knowing much of stuff about YP, but without knowing. So going in the, dire in the right direction, but not surpassing the threshold of knowing YP. Right, but if you switch to probabilistic inference, uh, right, enlarging the evidential base, so giving you more factual knowledge, reading the book about Stalin and so on, is going to enable you to draw more and better inferences, right? Well, but but does it? I mean, so so yeah, I, I guess it, then it starts to depend on the uh, specifics of the account, right? With Hills, it's for instance, it's it's a little difficult to see. I mean, she never tells us, I think, what the P primes and the Q primes are. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, I mean, it looks as though the only information that matters to your degree of understanding is that you believe that P and that you believe that Q is Y P or something like that, right? So all the other information that you may acquire seems not to be able to affect your degree of understanding at all, right? And maybe like, you know, you can have more sophisticated um, um, versions of this. I mean, direct and so on, like, you know, I think has problems in the opposite direction, right? More like the, the other view. He thinks in order to understand, you need to have a theory. Um, so I think like, you know, I mean, yeah, maybe that's true of scientific understanding in humans, right? And, and that's like, you know, what he's kind of really interested in, but I'm interested in the nature of understanding, <laughs> like, you know, uh, uh, and, and I think you can, you can understand stuff without a theory. Right, or at least understand it better than you did before without like, you know, now having a theory, unless you want to like, you know, everybody has a theory about everything where it's like that requirement completely trivializes. Well, I mean, very quickly, uh, for those of you who are interested, Hank has kindly agreed to give a talk at Chelfis December 13th. So uh, if you're able to make it, please join us. And uh, also, I think that the book version uh, says that this uh, only applies to theoretical physics, the, the science from which he draws most of his examples. So um, I think he's quite open to um, alternative uh, modeling in different scientific disciplines, but yeah. Yeah, yeah anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to point that out. <laughs> okay. No, no, this has been absolutely amazing, Chris, and um, uh, quite a thought-provoking talk. And um, uh, I'm uh, very uh, happy that we had Paulina presenting her own view here, and now we had you presenting your own view on moral understanding. So there's a live debate and uh, happy to, to uh, be able to contribute to that. Uh, thank you so much, and please join me in thanking Professor Christopher Kelp for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. Really, really great comments. Great discussion. Thank you.